Hello and welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. Thank you for joining us today for our program, Practical Public Health Ethics for ADPH Staff. Continuing education credits have been approved for nurses and social workers for today's program. In order to receive credit for this training, you must watch the entire program, then complete and return the sign-in sheet and evaluation. While content may continue to be relevant, continuing education credit will only be awarded for one year for nurses, expiring on December 30, 2017, and two years for social workers, expiring on December 30, 2018. If you want to receive a social work continuing education certificate, then you will need to complete the social work test and send it in along with your sign-in sheet and evaluation. I'm Renee Carpenter, State Social Work Director for the Alabama Department of Public Health, and with me is Jim Sacco, a public health consultant based in Atlanta. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Renee. Good morning. Good morning. Morning, morning everybody here. Uh, our topic today, uh, public health ethics. Uh, what I want to say at the onset is what struck me about preparing for this is it seems like there are a lot of ethics workshops in which we focus on the one-on-one -on -one relationship. Duty to warn issues is uh, patient confidentiality. And um, I think those are all really important. But what struck me, especially for public health social workers who work in a macro level or think about macro level social work, does that uh, social work term off some of us. It's been a while since we were in school. Um, but but how public health decisions are made. And so this is, is a, a little different perhaps than some of the other ethics classes you've taken. But what strikes me is if we are doing our job on the front line in public health, even if we aren't at a decision-making level, even if we don't interact with policy makers, I think it's really important that people on the front line understand the why of public health decisions. What I know about being a worker, being public health, is there are many, many times, please don't raise your hand here in the room, in which we say, well, how the heck did somebody decide that? Nobody in this room, nobody in this audience, this live audience, ever thought that. Uh, but, but I think uh, there, there is a, a complex way in which public health decisions are made, and part of that is public health ethics. And so, so again, our, our thought today is, is how we do our work as frontline public health people uh, and understand an ethical framework for making decisions in public health. That's really the overarching. There he is. Mother and daddy bought a master's degree in social work from the University of Georgia. I always give mother and daddy credit. Let's hope Rhonda's kid gives her some credit someday uh, <laughs> for Rhonda's hard work. Uh, and and, and uh, yeah, as Renee said, I'm a, a consultant based uh, in Atlanta. I've been involved, gosh, every time I come to Montgomery, it's at least 20 years, probably longer. My first, my memory, my first visit to uh, ADPH was I collaborated on the AIDS Symposium way, way back in the day down at the Convention Center. Uh, Sandra Langston was uh, just out of nursing school, so how long could that have been? Jane Cheek was not the director yet. Anyway, so so it's been a while. I have most of you know uh, 20 plus years collaborating with uh, STD program, HIV program, family planning, lots of family planning. Been involved in several social work things here. Done uh, a number of video conferences. So it's always a, a pleasure to be asked to to talk to ADPH staff. And I'll, I'll tell you a story. I was over in in my motel last night, and there's a I guess I can say this. There's some CDC people doing a site visit, one of the programs here. I won't say which program. They do fine work. Uh, but we were, <laughs> but we were, we were talking about it. We were talking about it, and, and what we both agreed, uh, when people talk behind your back, I think sometimes, what we both agreed is what fine work happens in this building. And, and so uh, she was a personal friend who just happened to be here doing a site visit, but we both talked about the quality of, of public health work, and she and I both have 25-plus years in public health. So perception uh, of strangers talking about you, the fine work that gets done here and, and across the state. I mean, the other part of this is certainly I've been trapped in Montgomery many, many times, but I, I've been in every public health region, uh, and the frontline folks doing their job in Talladega and Baldwin County and way up in the shoals with Rhonda. I've been everywhere uh, 
uh, just fine people doing important work. So anyway, I'm always glad to be here, and uh, that's what I do. I've got, people always say, well, do you do real social work? Well, I have done real social work, uh, a mixed bag of mental health and substance abuse. But, but since uh, sometime in the, in the late 80s, make my living as a trainer. So I, I'm a social worker doing health education. That, that's At a cocktail party, that's how I tell people what I do. Uh, so because I'm a health educator, I, I know to show my slide with the objectives. There they are. Uh, like you said, uh, any, any good workshop on ethics kind of lays some foundation, but also invites you to think about a decision-making process, that, that, that my goal today is, is to help with the decision-making process, kind of think through how we make decisions in public health. And again, as I said, some of you are in a position to run programs, hopefully, uh, we got people running programs doing this. Uh, certainly, most of us interact with decision makers and policy makers. A at the very least, I think to be able to understand in our role as frontline staff how decisions are made, and perhaps more importantly, convey to public health consumers. And I think the one-on-one -on -one consumer across from you, uh, the person whose restaurant we're fitting to shut down because uh, they did not pass the inspection, for instance, uh, and explain to communities why uh, we've cut back on services or added services or why certain public health decisions have made. I, I do feel like in public health, if we're doing our job well, there's something about good customer service. And part of what was exciting about this workshop to me was thinking of our consumer, not just as the person across the desk, but thinking of our customer in public health in the broader context, our communities and, and the the people that we serve. And, and so again, the last thing, we're going to talk some about challenges, talk a little bit about public health challenges. I've got a couple cases, but I also hope that uh, we'll have a chance to uh, uh, interact with each other about, about some challenges you face. So uh, the other uh, outcomes there, we'll talk a little bit about law. Again, the law is thought of as, as kind of foundation, like the law is the minimum standard. I, I hate to if any of your people are lawyers, I hate to say it that way, but, but most people who talk about ethics think about law as the minimum standard, but if you think about how decisions are made, the first question, Charlena will tell us, is how do I stay out of prison? Isn't that your first, uh, as you're deciding <laughs> what's the right thing to do here, it's, I would look terrible, it is not, orange is not the new attractive, right? You're going, okay, I don't want to go to prison, at least that's what I do, right? I go, I don't want to go to prison first, and then... What's the ethical thing to do? So we'll talk a bit about that. Like I said, I, I've got a couple different case studies that invite us, but I also hope people will bring your challenges. And, and, and then again, some, some thoughts about the day-to-day. -day. So, so uh, we're going to start with kind of what public health ethics are and the why. Um, as you uh, think about <coughs> ethics, part of what, what I should say before I get too far, this course has been heavily influenced by two sources, the CDC uh, office of the Associate Director of Science produces excellent materials. As I was doing this work, uh, that was extraordinarily helpful in, in terms of getting here. And uh, the uh, uh, Association of Public Health, uh, the American Public Health Association, APHA. Uh, and, and so uh, I've borrowed heavily from other people. If you're sitting there thinking in the audience or on the video, boy, that's the smart, that ball guy's the smart guy. Uh, the ball guy was smart enough to, to think about some really smart sources. Uh, you'll, you'll see citations at the end, but, uh, but I want to give credit. Uh, what, what, I, what I do is I also want to start with this idea of morality. If you think about ethics and morality, uh, I, I, obviously there's a connection. Anybody, if you were to define ethics, uh, anybody here willing to give me a word or phrase that comes to mind? Ethics in public health, a word or a phrase. Doing the right thing. Doing the right thing, absolutely. So ethics is about doing the right thing, is about another word, another phrase. Integrity. Integrity, you bet. Values. Mm -hmm. Decision. Doing the right thing with integrity. Consistency comes to mind. You know, that, that part of how we, uh, at the very least, consi a consistent process. The other, the other thing that comes to mind that's integral to this class is, is a, a well-considered uh, process for doing this. The, the, the ethical practice is guided by we have a decision-making process as opposed to we sort of spontaneously, oh, we just made our mind up and acted in an ethical way. I think the, the basis for this course, and I, and I think most discussions about ethics, 
uh, assume that you've got a logical, thought-out process that gets you to that. So when we think about morality, um, uh, morality really is more about right and wrong. Uh, the, the, the Course asks us to think about widely shared beliefs uh, that, that we, uh, we as humans hold. Uh, long-standing, uh, the other part of what I think of is, is multi-generational. M morals don't change. You know, again, uh, uh, so if I were to think about, if you were to think about examples of moral, uh, morals that guide our decision making, let's uh, a, a sort of long standing value that we bring in public health. Anybody got an idea? Moral sort of s standard that's been with us for generations? You got it. Um, this may not be what you're looking for, but I'm thinking um, using being non-judgmental. You bet, you bet, absolutely. That 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 approach to patients, absolutely. We think about long-standing right and wrong. Uh, it's not okay to hit people. Is one most of us bring to our practice, right? Some of us have worked violence. So the physical violence is not acceptable. It, it is one that that comes to mind, and and so. Uh, while we make decisions uh, uh, about our practice, there are some things that are long. See, it is not okay to, to harm people. Uh, uh, welfare of children is another moral. To me, that's a moral thing. I always, I always, uh, I always admire people who work with children because I made a decision a long time ago in my career. I couldn't do that. You know that that for me, there's something about looking at like, looking at a 40 year old acting stupid. You can say, well, there they are, acting stupid, right? But when that affects children and, and causes harm to children, my ability to be non-judgmental, my ability to have therapeutic detachment goes out the window. And I've, I've known enough people that have done it that I've got great respect for them, but how you sit across uh, from uh, abusive parents, neglectful parents, and act in a way that's therapeutic is not a skill I have. That's not... That's not why they hired me here. So, so again, what you should be starting to think about is there's a connection between ethics and morality, uh, but uh, that it's, it's broader than that. So um, let's think about ethics, and, and I guess rather than, than giving you a definition, let's think about how uh, decisions are made using an ethical decision-making. Tree, you are director of a social work in a, in a region, in a county. Some of you have got a county-level decision-making process. And word came from this building, 15, 20% across the board cuts. So step into the role of someone who decides at the county level, at the region level, you're going to have to cut 20% off of direct services, or, or your budget includes direct services. How do you decide? How do you decide what to cut, how to cut, how to make, you know, Bottom line is, um, and unfortunately some of us who've been around for have seen that. Rhonda, what do you start to think? You there running a health department, uh, some uh, memo comes, you're going to cut 20%. What's your, what's your thinking about? How do you decide? That? What questions do you ask? What are we mandated to perform? Okay. So what are we mandated? What's our mandate? Often all of our funding says this is what must happen. So sort of what's the minimum standard based on our agreement with our funder? What else? Well, one of our major problems is, is we're down to one worker counties. So when we tell them that, then it's, well, there's only one worker there working multiple programs. So we have to make our priorities of which program are we going to shift them to there you go. to focus there on. There you go. So the question, which program, let's stay with that a little deeper. As we think, which program do we cut? I'm one social worker, one arm paper hanger is the phrase that comes to mind. I'm TB, I'm immunization, I'm closing down restaurants. Uh, what's the way in which we decide which programs? The least harm. Least harm. There you go. So least harm in in the at the community level, at the individual level. Both. Both. Yeah. Yeah. How else? So wh where where we're going to have the least harm? So other aspects to this. I'm worried about PR, y'all. Right. I mean, the bottom line. Renee nodded. I shouldn't say that, but you know, the bottom line is who wants to end up on the front of the newspaper. Here's what Arnetta said we ought to cut, right? And, 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 uh, and, and so sort of public reaction. Uh, burden of disease? I mean, at, at some point, if I'm, if I'm looking at do I, do I follow that one 
measles case or those 20 TB cases. I got no idea what county we're talking about, but but I got to decide. I think burden of disease is part of the decision making process. That that uh, again impact of of health relates to burden of disease. What else comes to mind as you think about this fictional budget cut? Other ways in which we decide. Other ethical questions. The staff that it will affect. Yeah. Yeah. Good. 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 So. So a way in which our ethical decision making is going to affect those people that have to clean up the mess, or uh, how it affects uh, other people. Yeah. I, I, again, I just wanted to get our wheels thinking because the point of a discussion about ethics and and that example of of having to do with limited resources, I think one that people have faced for some time will continue to face in public health. Um, and, and, and so here's the answer, uh, the, the answer, uh, uh, principles that guide our action. Uh, again, these questions that you ask about, about impact, about, the, about right and wrong, about, about what's uh, public health good, uh, analyzing the rightness or wrongness of political, of particular actions, uh, what choices and what moral norms. Uh, here's one I want to put out people in the room. Nobody in this room's ever had to do this. We've all known people in public health who've had to. When is a lie justified? We all believe in, raise your hand, truth is good. Everybody, I want to say, truth is good. Yeah, truth is good. When? Again, nobody in this room. When is a fib the ethical choice? Anybody ever known somebody who's had to do that? I'll start you off. Uh, I always think of a nun True story, nun and so, former nun, I guess she, no, she was a nun, nun and social worker who uh, worked with homeless people. And bless her heart, she sometimes would forget to tell the housing facility that the person had a substance use history. I just kind of forgot to include that detail. I always refer to her as the lioness nun I ever met, but... <laughs> At some point, doing God's good work, she said, you know what? Getting a roof over this person's head means I can maybe not disclose. Other times when not telling the truth or the whole truth, again, not from our personal experience, but might be the right thing to do. How else does not sharing all the truth? Uh, Come on. Go ahead. No, I was thinking in uh, some experiences here, because we don't do that here. No. Um, would be sometimes we choose, I don't think it's ethically, but sometimes we choose not to divulge the truth because you don't want to get the whole staff in the uproar about imminent stuff that has to, that might be coming down the line. So just not disclosing information to avoid impacting the staff? Yeah. Absolutely. Just not telling all the details? I was thinking of uh, medical situations where. Um, may not be the right timing okay. to disclose the severity of okay. something to a person who's possibly maybe ill themselves, yeah, yeah, family yeah. member, and you're having to disclose some information about that, a particular, another family sure. member. You, sure. you may not disclose everything. You bet. May not disclose everything. What I'm thinking as you're talking is we know what could go wrong. Right. And somebody said, well, what might happen? I think all of us say sometimes, I ain't going there. Right. You might have to chop your foot off. From your dive, we ain't talking about no until we have to chop that foot off. Let's cut back and say there are serious complications of diabetes and keep it at that level. Maybe, right? Anybody else? Times when not given all of the truth. Anybody? Well, we know people who may have bent the age requirement for certain programs. Again, nobody in this room. But we say, I got somebody, it's Friday at four o'clock and this person needs a service. Again, nobody here. Uh, and so maybe we just don't gather. Information. Other times we... Again, we all agreed that truth is important, that honesty as a value is something. And uh, part of why I, I do this is, is to think about the gray area and, and that part of what... Uh, part, of the, part of the reason for having a decision-making tree is because in the gray area of Charlena, it is 4 o'clock, and somebody there in your clinic wants a service, or somebody calls and says, shut this restaurant down, or somebody says, hey, we go to church together, girlfriend. I need to dig a well, but it's not permitted. Oh, <laughs> oh, uh, uh, right? Um, 
again, we all, uh, t if you've been in public health a while, we, we face gray area about how, about how to decide. So, uh, so some background on theories. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but just the idea that, that sometimes over on the left side of your slide, there, there are theories that really focus on uh, ethics as an individual level, the individual actor, the individual person, and their ethics, their ethics rather, sort of, sort of uh, how they make ethical decisions. Uh, the, the, the second model there uh, really speaks to uh, kind of the overarching values, the big picture uh, about uh, the, the phrase that, that I think is important is obligation, that, that ethics come from a place of obligation. And, and the, the third theory, and, and again, I didn't want to spend a lot of time, but as we think about how we come to our personal ethics, how health departments, how ADPH decides, to me, it's really some hybrid of these individual lev level. Again, I act in a way that's consistent with my uh, nursing code of ethics, my uh, social work code of ethics, my health educator code of ethics, uh, that, that the second step talks about uh, a acting on, on ways that, that uh, uh, are consistent with, with sort of values and beliefs. And this last one, which also I think is, speaks to how decisions are made, and again, I, I think what we do is sort of a hybrid, is what's the impact? And, and again, I go back to what Renee said, we think about how public health decisions are made that thinking about uh, what potential harm and benefit uh, to the public health good. Again, part of what's unique about thinking about ethics in this context is if we'd been here just talking about confidentiality and privacy and those one-on-one -on -one things, we wouldn't have thought through what I think most of us are charged with, which is how do we ensure the public health good while acting in ways that are ethical. And so that last uh, set of reminders about weighing the consequences, I think, is, is really important. So uh, a, a bit about uh, history, and then, then I want to get into a case. I've, I've got a case that I think is in. So, so bioethics, uh, again, if we talk about how we got here, the, 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 the uh, really about biological research, medicine, sort of, sort of you think about uh, how uh, research ethics are decided and, and how things are decided. And then, and then uh, the, the, the course also asks us to think about the day-to-day the -day clinical decisions that people in frontline public health make and, and recognizing that, that while they're not necessarily inconsistent, um, that there can be conflicts between how uh, sort, of, sort of what hard research says versus what we decide. And again, having worked in, in public health 25 plus years, um, there's what this sort of protocol guidelines, if I was at UAB in a funded research study with all the bells and whistles that uh, UAB, a very nice university in case we get sued, uh, very nice, great people at UAB. Uh, but, but we've all seen sort of what the gold standard is in a research well-funded setting and then we talk about a public health uh, setting in which maybe we're cobbling together, maybe we're on that, in that one person social work office and, and and what I think about is usually in those one-person offices, we're not talking about state-of-the-art laboratory, maybe not talking about state-of-the-art clinical tools. And the reality is that in direct clinical care and direct frontline public health social work nursing, we're faced with sort of what's the, what's the best thing to do given uh, the constraints that, that we've got. So uh, research ethics, again, I think about IRBs, and some of you may have been part of studies in which we think about how to protect the needs of uh, research subjects and, uh, uh, and, and, and again, for this talk, uh, the idea of public health ethics. So on your slides there, uh, in, the, in the handouts, uh, some uh, interesting ideas that, the, the, uh, the reason I've hit on these, these are uh, research ethics, uh, but what they speak to is, uh, I think, long-standing ideas. I, I pulled these out because these uh, Belmont principles, again, established from research settings, um, have four or five foundational uh, concepts that are in every ethics class that, that guide the, the creation of this decision-making model that, that I think guide ethical practice. Uh, everybody who went to social work school the first day, they said autonomy. 
Raise your hand. I heard about autonomy day one. You, you, you skipped class that day if you didn't hear about that. Patient right to self-determination, right? And, and so, so as we think about sort of what, what God's good public health practice, uh, respecting people, again, I, I, as preparing for this, I reviewed the, the NASW code, the, 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 the code for nurses, and, and respecting person's autonomy, uh, I, I think is central. What's, what's particularly important in public health, maybe differentiates us from other uh, clinical practitioners, is particular attention to those who are disenfranchised. That part of why I can say I'm proud to have spent a career in public health is I think there are a lot of people uh, for whom protection of those with diminished autonomy wouldn't be a priority in their code of ethics. And, and some of us may think, gosh, if only I'd gone to work for my brother-in-law writing mortgages, I'd made more money or maybe wanting our kids to uh, make another career choice. On the other hand, uh, to be able to say that we've been a part of helping people uh, whose uh, autonomy is compromised or potentially compromised, people who are socially, politically uh, disenfranchised, is at the heart of what makes public health different. I think for most of us, it's part of what's rewarding. Uh, again, two concepts that come up in every class, beneficence, uh, non-maleficence, do no harm, do no harm at a minimum. As we're deciding, it's Friday at 4 o'clock and someone's asking me, keep my, keep my restaurant open, don't shut me down. I don't wanna, that, that's the one that keeps coming to my mind. I don't know, is it, is it just me or does the rubber hit the road Friday at 4 o'clock in a county health department? Uh, People out on people out on home visits. We know every every social worker in Alabama out on a home visit. I can I can make that joke because I am one. But you got you got, you got half the people out sick or off to soccer on a home visit, and the phone rings and somebody says, "Hey, help me out. Want to build a well? Want to keep my restaurant?" So so do no harm. Uh, uh, beneficence means maximizing the benefit. That, that beneficence means we all come to this work to do. Good, and this last set of reminders is about justice, is about fairness, is about equity, and that the ethical principles that guide public health practice need to include uh, making sure people get what they deserve. Again, I'd argue maybe some of the ways in which public health is, is different. And this last bullet, fair distribution of, uh, as we talked about those budget cuts, uh, part of what, what came up as we talked about our dis budget cut decision making tree was uh, how do we distribute based on benefit and burden to people. Uh, so let me, uh, uh, so uh, there, there's your definition. I'm not going to read to you. We, we've got, uh, so ethical principles, we've already talked about that. Uh, public health decision making. All right, so clinical versus public health ethics. Again, you'll see some overlap there, but the reason I thought this content was especially interesting to me and added to, uh, I think, a conversation about ethics in public health is, is that whole idea that, that focus on population, community, and institutions. The idea that we're moving beyond the individual level, again, seeing those values of autonomy, um, and, and thinking about doing social good and avoiding social harm, unique to people who work in public health. I think for people that work in other social service agencies, provide health care in clinics or doctor's office, thinking through what the larger uh, social good, the larger impact on the public health good is not something that our colleagues in the private sector think of. It's not meant to be a criticism. I think it's just a difference based on our practice settings. Uh, again, everybody, the reason I focus this on what people within ADPH might be thinking about is, is as you think about all the decisions we make, all the ethical decisions we make, that, that this sense of uh, the big picture and this last bullet about social justice, that, that I don't want to get on a political soapbox, that would be inappropriate. Uh, in, in this context. However, I think if you look at what the Associate American Public Health Association, other sort of guiding, they say we are committed to a kind of societal fairness and, and equity for persons in our culture. And, and so that, uh, again, I think makes the, unique, the ethics of, uh, of public health and the decision making that we do in public health unique. So uh, again, why, why talk about public health ethics? Again, give us a, a, a justification uh, for 
our course of action. Uh, uh, transparency in decision making. Again, I said earlier that that our accountability to to stakeholders, both consumers and communities and politicians. Oh yes, I did. Means we got to be able to justify uh, that. That sometimes a question at the county level, at the city level, certainly at the state level, comes up. Hey, why y'all do that? And 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 uh, a policymaker, a politician says, you got to tell me why you did it, having a well thought out uh, decision making tree in public health means well, Representative so and so, sure, certainly I wouldn't name a name on the video, Representative so and so, uh, we are delighted to tell you how public health decisions are made in this building and here's the, the decision making process that we use. Uh, uh, again, making sure our, our deliberation is, is respectful. Some of us have been in difficult meetings if you've been around for a while. Uh, uh, again, that example of we've got to cut services based on a funding cut, I think about where things could get tense and emotional and why my program and not yours. And those heifers don't work, but we do. Nobody ever uh, uh, would, would think to criticize your colleagues in those difficult budget decisions. I'm talking about over Mississippi, that happens often. In those <laughs> but certainly, once you cross the river, that never, ever comes up over here, uh, uh, public trust. And then uh, the, the last bullet there is, is about uh, the integrity of what we do. Somebody used that term, but, but that we're using good science to decide. I mean, part of... Part of the decision making, uh, again back to my example of, of, of budget cuts and what we keep, is, is about efficacy. Are we using evidence-based approaches? What's the approach? Uh, what's the evidence behind that? And is the science behind our decision right? You know, many of us have been around for a while and people wanting to continue public health programs or get new funding, and the science is not there. You know, and, and, and again, that, that very difficult decision of how do we say to people, sometimes well-intentioned, sometimes scammers, but sometimes well-intentioned people say, oh, I got this great idea, I'm going to save the world, and I'm, I'm uh, somewhere down in Doth, and I came up with this great idea, now fund me. And you go, well, girlfriend, there's no research behind that. There's no science to demonstrate that. And so uh, good people in Doth, don't get me wrong, some of the best people in Alabama, but as an example where you got to say, in the absence of hard science about the efficacy, we had to decide to support other things because that is part of a good public health practice. Uh, so uh, offering vocabulary and guidance principles and norms. Uh, I'm going to keep moving because I want to get to our case and our model. Let me, there we go. Um, so uh, this is our, our model for deciding and, and, and sort of uh, what the course offers is a, is a, a model for doing this. I'm going to do this quickly because we're going to walk through how to analyze, again, this, this decision-making model this course puts forward, uh, a way to analyze the ethical issue, uh, evaluate the ethical dimensions, and then this last to provide justification. Uh, so, so there we go. Uh, as we think about, let me go ahead. Well, no, let me do this and we'll do the case. So, so as we're thinking about, we've talked about much as what's the risk and harm of the, of the decision we make. So as we think about uh, decisions we make, risk and benefit has to be there. Uh, how does it relate to our public health goals? Again, everybody in this room, everybody watching on the video, look at your stationery, look at what's on the wall. It says we will protect the public health good of the citizens of blank, fill in the blank, whatever county, whatever city usually the great state of Alabama. So, so recognizing that that analysis of protecting uh, the public health good, generally what that means is uh, health promotion and disease prevention, right? So we are preventing disease, preventing mortality, promoting uh, healthy habits. That, that's what we do here. Uh, so uh, what, what are the, the, the stakeholder investment in what we're doing? And then uh, th this question of, of legal authority, can we shut this person's, can we shut this person's restaurant down? Can we allow this person to build a well uh, based on what we know. Uh, w uh, again, in consultation with your lawyers, most of us who are worker bees are not going to think about, not going to be able to answer that next question. What's the precedent? What's the legal precedent? Sort of, sort of what's happened before. And then I think for all of us, again, certainly social work nurses, we've got a code of ethics that ought to guide our, our practice. And so as we start to think about this, this analysis of the ethical questions. I all, always try, and I don't remember consistently, I always try to go into those reviewing what, for me as a social worker, the NASW Code of Ethics says. And again, it's clearly uh, a code for nurses, clearly a code for health educators, and most of us, 
uh, if, you, if you don't have a professional affiliation. APHA offers a, a, a code of ethics for everybody working in public health that says here's what good public health practiced. So the second question, our decision-making tree, the second part of the process is uh, to evaluate uh, the ethical dimensions of our decisions. Uh, again, three questions. Utility, there on your hand, utility, justice. We've talked about these concepts. Uh, and the last one, again, respecting for individuals. The, 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 the term uh, respect, uh, I think, is important. Again, this, this potential conflict between the individual good and the public health good is what I think about. And this last set of reminders in our decision-making tree, um, how do we justify uh, the decision that we've made? Uh, again, it, how it relates to the public health goal. And we talked about this earlier, the benefits, uh, the proportionality, the benefits outweighing the cost. Again, the cost benefit of our ethical decisions. Let me move to a case. Uh, where is it? There it is. Let me keep moving. All right. So um, everybody in the room kind of think about uh, an example from environmental health. Let me read you the story. Again, if you're watching on the video, just kind of make notes. Uh, everybody with me in the room? Take a, take a swig of something, a little swig of iced tea. Uh, we were serving Bloody Marys this morning, so a swig of that. If you and stay, No, no, no. One thing that never happens in the RSA Tower, we never serve drinks before noon. Uh, stay... State law requires local health departments, this happens every, to, to order lead hazard remediation. Lead, ha lead is bad, right? Everybody raise your hand, lead is bad, right? Lead ha uh, in, in the homes of lead poisoned children. Children got lead, we've got to remediate that. The law requires the health department to uh, put a placard up, order occupants to vacate homes uh, with, with lead hazard, right? Get, get out of your house, this is unsafe. Your kids are showing signs of lead. Health department may grant multiple extensions uh, to... Uh, uh, control orders before uh, putting the, the placard closing down the property. A number of cases, homeowners have requested extensions claiming they don't qualify for grants to remediate and lack out-of-pocket resources. So people are saying, wait, I don't have resources. I'm falling through the cracks. Uh, state law requires also create a fund to help those people, but no funds have been allocated. Again, certainly it never happens in Alabama. We create a fund. Uh, but don't actually put any resources in the kitty to help with that. I'm talking about your friends uh, uh, to the east over in Georgia who've made some dumb decisions to uh, put forward ideas that they never fund. Since I live there, I can make fun of them. Uh, health department and sanitation personnel, nurses are reluctant to, to go close these people down, shut these people out of their house. Uh, also concerned about their future ability to work with this child's family. So you know what you're supposed to do. Patients, fall, families falling through the cracks. You're supposed to go close it down. The frontline staff are saying, wait, we're going to have to work with this family, work with this child. How if we close them down? Health department's lead poisoning program director asked the health department's ethics advisory committee for advice and guidance. Uh, these are people from the board, management staff, academic persons, pastor who ministers to families exposed to lead public health lawyer, retired elected official, local businessman. In the past, the committee's invited other community stakeholders. Um, other community stakeholders. Um, if you were sitting on that panel, what are some of the issues that would come to mind? Again, we don't have to come to a decision, but you're there on this panel We've got homes with lead, people don't qualify for funding, falling through the cracks, people on the front line saying, I don't want to put these people out their house because i got nowhere to send them, and it affects my ongoing. Uh, what kind of advice and guidance do you want to give to the front line staff and the leadership in the lead control program? Why don't we do just a quick grab the two people seated beside your groups of three. Uh, we're going to do just a four or five minute brainstorm real quick with people next to you. Uh, again, if you're watching on the video, just make some notes during the three, four minutes my experts are working. Um, what kind of advice, guidance do you have for the frontline folk and people who run the program as they look at this lead remediation program 
where there are holes in the process. All right, just a quick three, four minute brainstorm and we'll see what issues come up. This may be advice and guidance, your advice or guidance may be additional questions that need to be asked. So what advice, what recommendations, what else needs to be asked? Quick brainstorm at your table and then we'll all come back and talk about how we're going to remediate lid. All right, let me check in. <laughs> Again, I didn't think we were going to have answers three or four minutes, but I thought it would be great. Uh, this example has some, to me, some real world elements to it, the imperfect practice. You know, again, I think if I were teaching public health students and they were just reading the textbook, I'd have to have them close the textbook and say, listen, y'all, here's the, don't you think there ought to be a whole other class on what happens in the real world? And like I said, I'd title it Friday afternoon at four o'clock, you know, or the deacon from your church calls and wants an exception or other, you ain't going to learn it in school kind of public health stuff. Like, we all want kids to be lead free and yet... Folks on the front line saying, I got to keep this relationship with family and whatever else. There's not resources to help remediate here. Uh, fr front group, just a couple ideas. What, ad what advice, what recommendations? What, what were your thoughts? Um, our, our first thought was to educate them on respect for the patients that's involved in the there situation. You there you go. You're talking about going to someone's home and one, giving them bad news, and then you're saying, now we're going to have to transition, relocate you. It's not safe. So um, that's the first thing. And yeah. you try to put yourself in their shoes. You bet. So, so empathy, empathy for the family. How are we going to keep in mind the needs of this family moving forward? If we blow that relationship, I, I kind of feel for those frontline staff. Like, hey, if they put us on call block, right, or, or run us out, we can't do nothing if the relationship is severed. We also wanted to make sure they knew about education of the effects of lead, the safety you concerns, bet. You bet. and to realize you have to start where that patient is. Good. Some people you can't go in and educate and 
lead causes brain damage and all this and they're going to know well where am I getting this from they could probably relate easier that you know your husband works at the local lead factory some of the things Very he's good. exposed to is coming home it's getting on the curtains it's getting everywhere yeah. so you really have to start where they yeah. are as far as the education yeah. you bet and, and then the most important thing is I think to assist with if it's nothing but a referral for housing or assisting the transition process, because it's a lot to tell me my house is non livable you anymore you bet. and we have to come in. You so better have a plan after that. You, you, be, you, you better say, uh, we're going to figure out what you know, we're going to educate you, we're going to be respectful, but then we're going to have resources so we're not, put, <laughs> we're not putting a sign up, closing people out of their house. What, what do you guys want to add? What other questions? Uh, back row, would you, Charlene? Um, I was thinking uh, you want to. Uh, of course, establish a bond with the family. But if you go in and uh, you say that you uh, your child has elevated lead, well, that means nothing to them many yeah. times. Yeah. But you always have to say lead poisoning yeah. to yeah. get their attention yeah. because if you don't get their attention, they're not going to take it seriously. Good. And uh, another thing, and I'm probably repeating a lot of what Anita yeah, said, but. Uh, Another thing we've found is you certainly don't want to go in and immediately tell them uh, you need to talk to your landlord and get this fixed. Right. Once they go to the landlord, they're probably going to be out on the street. Yeah. So you have to have a plan for where they are going to transition yeah. to an, uh, another housing unit or something. Yeah. You can't you can't just say, hey, you need to tell your landlord and he needs to fix this yeah. because yeah. that doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, again, talking about the needs of people who are disenfranchised, w what a white middle class assumption to say, well, they'll just fire that landlord and go get another. And, and I, I just a couple weeks ago did a homeless conference for a couple of days with homeless providers. And, uh, you know, what they're saying is, look, we got her an apartment. We ain't making any waves because there aren't any other options. And, and I think about how many of our most vulnerable folks the place they're in is the best they're going to be able to do and to say well you go march up to that landlord and tell him off right I'm a landlord it's easy to put them out right and get somebody else so this idea that uh, their immediate safety uh, really could be could come into play what haven't we talked about other questions other recommendations we were questioning the, the age of the children because we would want to target most of our efforts on the younger children versus yeah. older That's children right. and teenagers sure, sure. Yep. And also if there was any way that the lead could either be removed or at least limit the exposure until okay. we could move okay. somewhere else. Yeah. So so into a harm reduction model. Sort of sort of into the idea of what strikes me is we may not be able to do it perfectly, like the reality of the world we work in. We may not be able to completely eliminate risk. How can we remediate based on age of the kids, limit exposure? Back group, other questions? What do you think? The other piece, that, and I guess maybe piggybacking a little bit of what Renee was saying, is that we also want to think about, yes, it's critical that we think about the ages of the children, but we don't want the older children or the adults in the home to forget about their own health needs. Right. And somewhere, yes, while they're in this crisis mode of trying to figure out how they can get their situation resolved, don't, don't let the the adult's health issues be forgotten, yeah. that yeah. they need to, you know, or that 13-year-old kid in the home, he does need to be tested for lead as well, yeah. but our crisis right now is the two-year-old who's got the elevated lead level of a 52. Let's get that handled and then move into yeah. the other ones. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a lot of ethical things about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's not, well, I mean, you know, like if you're the social worker and you can't get any, I mean, say Flint, Michigan. Exactly. I mean, let's let's know, bring it right we, back. Let's bring it right back yeah. now. Yeah. To, you know? to a place where, I'm just going to say it, as best I can tell, uh, harm was done that people knew about Absolutely. for a period of time. The work of bringing that to the attention of the person in charge, yeah. you know. And, and what strikes me about that, Rhonda, th thanks for bringing it up, what none of us touched on because it's so hard, is the political ramifications exactly. and that at some point, as advocates, again, a way in which public health professionals are different than a, a nurse in a pediatric office, our code of ethics, our decision making is about social justice. And what most of us in public health know is those people are 
uh, again, vulnerable in ways that we have to step up and, and think about social action, think about the politics of it, and, and sometimes ask hard questions or at least encourage our boss or their boss's boss to ask some hard questions up the decision-making tree because ethically to sit by and say how can we establish a fund with no funding available and have people fall isn't for us in public health isn't an ethical isn't an allowable ethical decision so what what do you want to add to what the hens had to say you uh, <laughs> sitting back there with all them answers what happened we thought of it anything else you want to add well it, she brought up Flint, michigan i'm thinking of oakland and the fire yeah that, this just happened just happened just happened and you know i heard a couple of the ladies interviewed say we don't have anywhere else to live exactly. this is why exactly. we chose this exactly. house exactly. Um, yeah there's so much limited housing in this community you bet and, and, and now they're looking to throw somebody under the under the bus for whose fault it was. Yeah, yeah. But so there were a lot of people that looked the opposite way. Yeah, yeah. They said it was an inspector there. Those joining us on the video, this is happening right after the Oakland warehouse fire, just to, to catch people up. And yeah, I heard um, uh, people saying an inspector was there a few days before, and said he couldn't gain access. Again, talk about frontline ethical decision. Uh, you got a bunch of students and young people, a lot of them were artists, I guess, who, uh, and I was, I just was on business in San Francisco. I know people say it every time they go there, but unbelievable housing costs, Unbel shocking, shocking. I mean, I'm, I I'm talking about the, the dumpiest dump at six, seven hundred thousand. I was looking at real estate, whatever. One bedroom is a million. In the city, so one bedroom is a million, and you might have an indoor bathroom, Rhonda, you might for a million. And, and two bedrooms starts at a million and a half in a, in a nice enough. Not, I'm talking about the grandest whatever. So, yeah, you got a bunch of art students. And somebody said, look, we want to support young people. And we want to give people who love this vibrant city who are studying art or working artists a chance to do their craft. And yeah, sure, let's, don't we all want that? And yet what they'd cobbled together may have contributed. And, and you're absolutely right, the the idea that that was it the right thing to do to have a thing you know I heard they had uh, uh, everybody had to have a fire extinguisher everybody so the other thing about that bills remediating the potential risk was was part of the plan it was well maybe somebody said we won't inspect too hard but also we're gonna have fire extinguishers and some sprinklers or anyway they had some plan to remediate and it didn't work on, on Friday night so young students and, and say either Tuscaloosa or Auburn sure. where there's a potential housing shortage. You bet. And you now bet. They, they have young children there themselves. You bet. Yeah, you, you, can't, you can't tell me somewhere in Tuscaloosa isn't, isn't a house that, that eight, eight young men, I hope none of y'all's eight young men living in marginal, uh, not enough exits, not a whatever else that's <laughs> been grandfathered, uh, you know, somebody just had, they've always had students house there, cheap student housing, whatever else, but that would, wouldn't be what the, the uh, code, I'm sure you're right, I'm sure that's every, and probably that's every city in Alabama. So uh, thank you. Like I said, just, just this idea to reinforce a, a decision-making process, both sort of what we advocate for and the complexity of how public health decisions are made, that, that part of why when people ask me to teach an ethics class, I'd rather teach something that was black and white. I promise. I'd rather be able to, here's what you got to do. You know, uh, uh, Renee, please ask me to come back and do a course on, on vaccines because I can tell you, <laughs> here's who to vaccinate. And doggone it, you got to vaccinate. And here's the right dose, right? I'd love to do a vaccination class next time I come because that black and white, when there are two, you do this vaccine. Uh, when there are three, you do it. This ain't that class. This is, uh, and, and yet it's important. It's important for us to think about. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep moving, moving, talk a little bit about the law. Uh, again, this is beyond what the scope of what I can do. Let me say up front, I'm trained as a social worker, not a lawyer. I certainly do not give advice uh, for the Alabama Department of Public Health about law. Uh, but there is a connection that, that law may be a useful starting point. It, it, it is the theme here. Like I said, you're going to see, see in the next slide, well, uh, one slide ahead, where law, I said earlier, was the foundation, was the minimum standard. And, and Charlena said 
She's been in social work a couple years. Charlena, what are you in your third year? Third year out of school? Oh, yeah. Third, third year out of, out of her social work school. Uh, and what she said is, how do, I get, how do I not go to prison is part of how she decides. And I said, you, uh, in the three years since you've been out of social work school, that's a very good, a that's a good, because I do not want to end up in no uh, reformatory because I didn't do whatever else. Again, uh, there's a connection because law does have some ethical principles as we talked about our principles just in the lead example. We did come up with what are some legal things as we talk about uh, public health environment. Uh, and, and again, laws are part of our framework for ethical decision making. I don't think they're the exclusive uh, way that we decide. Um, again, the, the last uh, set of reminders here uh, that, that uh, both law and ethics invite us to consciously decide, to deliberate, to think through. And that last bullet is important. In the end, we, stay, we still may disagree. Uh, again, uh, some of us have been part of part of discussions where we say, well, what does the law tell us to do about X, Y, Z public health problem? And it may not be clear. And, and again, that's why for most of us on the front line, we aren't the ones who ultimately decide that. We kick that up, the, the food chain, so that, that somebody else in the system decides. There are times in which uh, Alabama law is crystal clear. There are times in which law isn't clear, and we still may have some disagreements. So there's a, the graphic I was telling you about. Uh, law is the minimum standard. And again, that's no offense to anybody, but that's just to say, as we're making decisions, we say, well, at a minimum, I want to make sure I'm legal. What Rhonda said, in addition to that, I want to make sure my funder is happy. And I think, yes, those are both sort of foundational. What have I agreed to do? Uh, I, I pick on Rhonda, but I know many of us have a relationship with the federal government, right? Some financial agreement with the federal government says, we're going to do X if you keep mailing us checks. And, and I certainly want to make sure that what we're doing is legal, but I also think making sure that what we're doing is consistent with our agreement to our funders has to be part of how we decide. And then sort of the ethical, what, what this does is sort of uh, offer a kind of hierarchy. Uh, is there ethical conduct? Is our conduct ethical? Uh, that's uh, uh, acceptable. And then does it speak to our ethical ideals? Sort of, again, I don't know that we ever get there, but I think we've all walked away from a decision that was made. Most of us have walked away from a decision that's been made maybe with a sour taste in our mouth because of a compromise we've had to make. Oh, I'm not talking about anybody in this room. I'm talking about uh, some people on the floors below us here in the, in the tower. Uh, but for whom maybe our decision was even ethical, but wasn't the ideal standard, wasn't uh, what, what we'd hoped for. And, and again, I think that's the reality of how public health uh, decisions are made. So, so obviously uh, uh, part of what law does is it gives us power to police people. Hey, your, your code enforcement kind of, kind of dis decisions, Bill, that, that sort of thing. Uh, to protect public health good, we've, we've got what kind of public health laws that police people's behavior? What do we got? Commu the example of communicable disease law, right? If, if you're going to give my sister syphilis, somebody's going to knock on your door. I guess I should say in the video, none of my sisters. <laughs> that word gets out. None of my sisters. Uh, bo both monogamous or abstaining or both, hopefully both. Uh, would be that person. However, uh, we want we want people notified, right, about their communicable disease. And so there's law that's been enacted, uh, laws that uh, require immunizations, do they not? To laws that require what other health conditions have some legal TB? You bet. Uh, you you uh, uh, as diagnose active TB. We gonna come out and visit with you, are we not? And some of us would say, I think that's a good idea. You know, we kind of let's let's do uh, uh, again back to that idea of the public health good. Uh, uh, some some ways in which law regulates smoking. You know, uh, again, what, what we're gonna talk about in a minute. What else? What else in terms of free speech and people's personal habits we ought to regulate? I mean, talk about tension. There are things that we do that are pleasurable, I'm talking about soda pop here, that are bad for us. No, I was talking soda pop, uh, that are bad for us. 
There are other things we do, but we're not. This 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 video is going to be related rated G, not PG thirteen. Isn't that right, Renee? We agreed to a G rating. We're going to do a G rating. So I'm going to talk about soda pop. It's something we do that's pleasurable, but has the potential for harm. Uh, anyway, seizure of uh, we're going to seize people's dopes if they do that. Um, So, so this case sort of set public health uh, example, the, the citation there, Jacobson. It's a, a smallpox case. Back in the day, we had a small, smallpox outbreak. Somebody, Jacobson, said, I don't feel like taking no smallpox vaccine. Right? Some of you have been around long enough, know somebody. that we had to say, no, brother, you don't get to decide about do you or don't you want. Again, that, that whole idea that we decide about uh, some public health interventions, not based on personal right, but about the public health good. And this was a case where we said, no, Mr. Jacobson, you, your right to, you know, we, we, we face this. I'm going to name the elephant in the room. We face this, I think, we face this with childhood immunization today, right? And we also face it with our newborn hearing screens as well. There you go. So, so give me the dilemma. We we say as a public health people, newborn hearing is a great great idea to catch them kids early. And and you, you're choosing not to have your hearing screen tested for your six month for your two month old child, and then you get in this question of well, how do you make the parent? Well, there's a law out there, but then that's medical neglect, and do you want to report that wow. or not report wow. that? And yeah. Um. So then, but. Yeah. It's very real. What what is medical neglect, right? And 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 so yeah, absolutely. I, I I'm I'm on a research project, and we're not nearly legislating it, but I, I'm on a research project, uh, totally different, but on on early autism screening. And if you haven't seen it lately, getting kids early, and there's early early screening tools versus wait until they get to school. The outcome is unbelievable, and 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 so. Getting that again, we're not there yet. But I looked at that research and I thought, you know, it won't be long before somebody asks if we can improve the outcome for that kid pre-age two versus getting to school. We need to mandate that parents that we do that kind of screening. Again, we're not there, but again, the idea of if we don't, the outcome to that kid. Yeah. So, so, so again, the idea that we are as a public health entity. In ADPH, saying we uh, believe in this. So, so uh, with the balancing act that that uh, uh, we don't want to, uh, we want to protect that individual's uh, right, uh, but but we recognize the public health good. And this last reminder is about due process. That that ultimately, with that family saying we don't want to do that screening, even though. You know, that, that we give people notice, we allow them counsel, people have our, this is still America. And, and, and again, as we think about vaccination, I mean, I think we're, uh, my sense is we are still encouraging vaccination, but if people bring their, put a stake in the ground and say, absolutely not, my kids won't be vaccinated for whatever reason, we are rolling with that still, are we not? I, I, think, I think that I look for that tension to continue because... <laughs> As someone who believes in liberty and autonomy, I say, you go, mama, no vaccination, that's great. It's America, off you go. And yet, my second grader sitting next to her second grader, for me, that starts to raise a much more difficult ethical dilemma, right? Um, so again, primarily what law does is it says what we must do, what we can do, uh, we can mandate what we can ma uh, mandate, uh, uh, again, you, you've got to have some re reference right back to uh, uh, what, uh, what the statute says, you know, that, that as we decide on the front line, as you justify to your patient, justify your, to your community, hey, here's why we're doing this. It really needs to have some legal standing behind it, and obviously for most of us on the front line. Um, uh, this last bullet, I think, is tough. Uh, in some cases, law may conflict with what we think is the right thing to do. And I think about, again, this tension between autonomy and the public health good as the one that comes to mind often, where parents don't want to 
uh, participate in screening. Or, or th that's a great example. Uh, don't want to immunize, and and yet the public health good. And there are times in which the law leans on the side of uh, allowing people to decide in ways that aren't appropriate, and, uh, and, or or that we may personally feel are not appropriate. So your your lawyers going to lawyer up downstairs. That's the reason why. Uh, the uh, Department of Public Health has people involved, uh, and yet they they may not be able to help us. They're going to they're going to say, "Here's what the law says." Sometimes there's clear cut. Here's what statute says. But if there's not precedent, uh, if it's uh, one thing I know about any public health department, certainly uh, any state health department, they're not going to go on a limb unless the lawyer says there's legal precedent to do this. I don't think any public health department wants to be the one setting. Uh, setting the tone and uh, they're looking for their lawyers to say here's uh, what to do and if that guidance doesn't exist if there's not uh, legal precedent most public health departments not going to uh, have anything to to do with it so so again some ideas about how law fits into this helps us deal with uncertainty uh, although it doesn't as I said earlier uh, so it provides uh, uh, some example let me keep moving uh, formal statutes and then always what the law says is what would a reasonable person do? You know, that, that where we don't have uh, a legal mandate, we don't have a precedent, uh, the, the, the last set of discussions, shall we pursue this person not getting vaccinated, shall we pursue uh, this, this person with TB not doing control measures, this person with uh, an, a, a sexually transmitted disease continuing to expose other people, uh, th this question of reasonable Person. What questions? Give me a minute. Uh, what do you want to know? I'm going to do one more example, then we're going to wrap up. Any questions about what we've done? Any comment? Rhonda Wanamy says she does not have TB as far as we know. We've used that TB example. And so as far as we know... But you, know, you, just, you just scratched in the surface yeah. in that example. Yeah, you know? yeah absolutely. Because it, you, got it, you brought up science mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. Well, the science around the vaccines. Mm -hmm. Then you and you've got unethical behavior on the internet, putting out bad information yeah. that vaccines cause this, this, this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, all of that's ethical questions. You bet. You bet. Yeah, I just I just had a news story today, uh, talking about how bad news and the election. I'm not going to weigh in on anything other than. They interviewed a guy on the Good Morning America or something who said, oh, yeah, I deliberately made up misinformation. Like, like that was his whole thing. And you think about health. I'm, I'm going to do a workshop later about uh, social media. If I'm sick, I'm going to go Google, what do I do about my immunization? Aren't we all? If you, your kid gets bad news, you get bad med, you're going to Google it, right? Well, what that leads me to is the reliability of what that's going to lead me to and uh, who decided that. I, I think uh, Rhonda's spot on. There's some of the vaccination stuff, which is not based on good science. Uh, but, but how do we allow... Come on, Shirley. Well, I was just going to say that uh, situation you referred to that I, I heard it also. Yeah, he was just deliberately misinformation. He, he was deliberately putting out misinformation for financial gain, yeah. but he was putting out misinformation about the candidate that he voted for. Yeah, yeah. Talk about ethics. Yeah. <laughs> He'd rather buy that new BMW, uh -huh. a nice car, don't sue us, but yeah, the whole, the whole idea that he was saying that let that money guide my thing. And again, as I talk about, uh, I don't want to go into my next talk, but, but there are some patient information websites. For instance, I'm Googling what to do about asthma that are selling my information, my address, to a company that can then send me information about their for-profit, whatever else. So you think, I'm Googling what to do about Rhonda's cough. I think, well, I'm just looking for health care information. There are sites that if I click and say, hey, I'm worried about Rhonda's cough, going to sell me to pharma or research or somebody. What a world we live in. Anyway, I want, I, want, I want to give you another example, and we're going to wrap. Uh, Drug-resistant TB. Most of us have been around for a while, right? Uh, so we, we got TB control measures, do we not? Drug-resistant drug resistant 
TB. Uh, uh, let, let's pick on a different town. Let's pick on Prattville. That's where Rhonda lives. Rhonda, uh, some some some, boo, some bougie family out in Prattville brought brought drug resistant TB. Good people, Prattville. Don't get me wrong. Uh, uh, but but there you are. We we got a law, but but somehow uh, out, out in suburban Montgomery, we got multi drug resistant TB. Uh, family adopt several children. That's how how it came about. Uh, strong religious beliefs. There, y'all. Raise your hand. I believe this is America. I believe in people's religious freedom. Raise your hand. A room full of people. Yes, religious freedom. Absolutely. Uh, refused immunization. Children are homeschooled. Right? Because of our religious beliefs, we don't like immunization. We will homeschool our children. Uh, one of the adopted children develops uh, a, a dry, non-productive cough. Isn't that dry? No. No, productive. TB is productive, right? I need a nurse. I need a nurse. I think it's room full of social workers scratching their head. We're gonna assume <laughs> TB is productive. I think. So, yeah. Uh, pediatrician says, "All right, y'all. We got active TB. Health department going out and visit. Health department intervenes. Right? Family says we don't believe in vaccination. We don't believe in immunizing. We believe in the power of prayer to manage this thing." What comes up as you think about this family for you? What? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. I don't want to be at the Chick-fil-A with them coughing on my grilled chicken wrap, something, right? So, uh, again, we all said yes to religious freedom, did we not? We all said, and yet, uh, that, that family's re refusal to take control measures, uh, to, to get on TB. And, and, and again, we're talking about TB, but there are people, again, immunization, I'm, I'm thinking about people that, that uh, for religious reasons, don't like certain medications, don't agree to certain treatments, uh, and yet the idea, what if this uh, symptomatic disease? Other reactions? Yeah, I, I think it's it's that that idea where I don't want to be in Walmart with them, but at the same time, there's something about sending law enforcement out to this this lovely family, bless their hearts, good Christian people, adopted children from overseas. There's something about uh, about the ethics of sending law enforcement out. Uh, from Renee's perspective, run a program. There's something about, so Renee, being on the news, you don't want to be on the news at no 6 o'clock. Renee says, no, I don't want to be on no news. So Renee, it's the 6 o'clock news. Why are you breaking up this poor Christian family? And you got to go, well, we love this family, but we don't love active TB, right? So it's, that, again, that set of competing demands we've been dancing around. Let me do one more thing. So, again, uh, uh, so, so some tools, again, what I, what I said is this class is going to offer some tools, kind of uh, trying to think through some cases. Some people actually develop and prepare cases uh, as a way to uh, do this, uh, thinking through what stakeholders would think of your decisions, uh, uh, using a deliberative, I talked earlier about the three-step deliberative process, looking at how values, uh, prioritization, factors into ethical decision making and then this last reminder just letting ethical principles guide us just just sort of uh, so so all of these are ways tools in which we come up with our personal uh, uh, code of ethics our personal so so again uh, the case-based approach just kind of says we we got a case in front of us we got a we got an issue here uh, uh, in this way, we kind of, okay, well, here's the situation. Family, we got to deal with. We had the lead paint. We had the, the TB. All of those kind of raise the question of what do we do about it. The, the case-based method, method really starts with we got a situation. What are we going to do about it? Uh, uh, again, if that's our approach uh, and, and we, we wait for things to come up, the, the great news is that, that really thinking through uh, the questions that case brings up, allows for thoughtful deliberation about uh, a way to to act. Uh, it, it gets us back to what our code of ethics ought to be um, and, and invites us to think about our rational, concrete decision-making uh, using ethics as the guide. If we're doing it well, um, uh, again, we can think about different perspectives as we're, we're studying cases. We can think about different uh, perspectives and then... Uh, 
uh, again, we can, as we've done today with the few cases we've had, uh, it, it raises the complexity. And again, uh, I'm going to come back and talk about something that's black and white. I promise, Renee, you're going to ask me to do something that's black and white because that's not an ethics class. It's just not uh, a, a black and white topic. But again, I think thinking through the processes. So another way to make another set of tools for ethical decision making is, is about stakeholder analysis. We sort of talked about this today, the interests, values of different stakeholders. Again, uh, what does, I think the, the committee for lead was a good example. What does the family need? What does the community need? What, what do the po political and decision makers need? Um, uh, again, naming the partners in that tension, thinking through everybody's uh, role in that. Uh, again, the next uh, set of tools is the deliberative process. I've talked about that model of, of thinking through is, is it just is it fair? How do we take action? Again, the, the whole idea here is that, that stakeholder values are weighed. We talked all day about health versus community, and, and I've brought up, and, and I'll reiterate, this idea you ask, what's the evidence behind this? What does the evidence tell us about uh, making this kid get a hearing test or not? Back back to uh, Melissa's example, like like what what is the evidence about not doing that and and where the science is sound enough we say uh, yeah we're gonna based on best practice let me show this picture because I speaking of best practice all right uh, which child seat is best there's three should be an easy decision uh, a third of you gonna be the engineering firm that designed and develops and sells that particular car seat. A third of you going to be the moms who put your children in the car seat. And a third of you going to be the MCH leadership at the county that's got a budget. <laughs> Look at Melissa Graff. <laughs> oh, yes, I did. <laughs> Who's going to have to budget? Which car seat you going to buy? Hmm. Now, if you are the people who developed and designed and sell that car seat, where are you going to go, my friend? Any thoughts? Hmm. I sure like that most reliable. I sure don't like that most economical, do I? And if you are the mama making this decision, where are you going to line up? I don't care what it costs, do you? The daddy? Well, maybe daddy going to decide which car seat. I'm thinking it. Where, where are you lining up as the mama? Most reliable. Most reliable. No question. Mama doesn't have any question, does she? And if you are the MCH director at the county health department level, we're going to not answer that in this public forum. We are going to bless and pray for the person that runs the MCH program, got to decide. And that at some level, what we're laughing about is the reality of public health decisions is juggling the economics and mama's need and the safety need and the public health good. And I love this slide because there it is. That, that's my Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock. I promise they, they ain't showing nobody in school of public health this slide, but I'd start my class with this. Wouldn't that be a go and right here you go. Third of you selling car seats, third of you mamas, third of you MCH directors just got another 12% cut to your budget, right? <laughs> right, right. Who, right, right. Exactly, exactly. Or, or, uh, or, or who's on social media about to complain about what a terrible health department you run? Let's factor that one in. The other part of it. Uh, so again, uh, part of what what this is about: no prioritizing values, uh, uh, no absolute best. A chance to kind of think about way in which decisions may feel like I've. Uh, health interdependence. Again, one of the ways that public health ethics are unique is about this interdependence. We think about autonomy, but in public health, uh, one of the unique features of, of our ethics in public health is that we think about the safety of those other people at Walmart or those other kids in school who, whose kids have, have been vaccinated. And, and uh, uh, it is a fact. adopt in the future and they're sitting here and they have children who have TB and yeah. you know and then you get into that thing of that dilemma do I need to share this if they're licensed by the Alabama Department of Human Resources for example 
and they're planning to adopt ten more kids, and yeah. you know, but then you're putting up that ethical dilemma of yeah. you, what you have to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, 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 what other agencies need to be involved? Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. And what's in the be what's in the best best? In who's your customer? I mean, that's the other question we face in public health. Who's my client here? Like, is it this kid who's here now? Is it the other kids in the family? Is it the public health good? And the answer is yes, yes, yes. Uh, so so uh, this was meant to uh, uh, be a different site. I'll just cite the public health leadership uh, societies. Excellent. Uh, APHA has their own, but I, I hit on this and I cut and pasted it. It's, it's not very good. But if you Google public health leadership society code, you're going to get there. Let me do one last kind of discussion that we got to go on. Here we go. Uh, childhood obesity. Raise your hand. Childhood obesity prevention is a good thing. Yeah, we all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way. Uh, sweet tea? Da no, 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 no. Uh, any town Alabama. Here we go. Any town Alabama. Uh, child obesity is a problem, they say. Uh, school menus have been altered. We've changed the school menus. We've uh, got new playgrounds uh, proposing a tax on trans fat and soda. City Council going to do that. Local business owners say, hold on. Uh, here we go, big government, G-U-B-M-E-N-T, government, right? Uh, at its worst, local parents say, we just big bone people. <laughs> we just big bone people up here in Fort Payne. Leave our children alone. I love Fort Payne now, don't get me wrong. And uh, increase in bullying has been reported as a result of your efforts, well-intended, Right, we're not. We're going to do a breakout group. We're going to do. Uh, these are the questions. So let's not break out. Let's just talk about how the rights of individuals and business has been considered. So what do you think? Uh, we all agree preventing obesity. Uh, rights of individuals. So I'm a business owner. I'm just trying to sell some sweet tea, y'all. I'm just trying to sell some biscuits and gravy. And I'll need you public health do-gooders. Anybody concerned about the rights of the individual? What current? So yeah. And what about the public health good? What do you see as the public health good? Taxing soda, taxing trans fat. Phil, what do you think? Where do you line up? We're going with public health good, or this guy's right to sell sweet tea? What do you think? I'm a biscuit and gravy kind of guy <laughs> myself. No, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> So he, he heard about the trans fat tax. I'm moving to the next county, right? I'm with you, brother. Yeah. What's the best solution for the health department? You, let's say you were a health educator at the health department. What are you going to do, Charlene? Well, I was just thinking, I, going back years and years and years ago, I mean, smoking could fit right in that. You bet. We could and have been here 30 years ago. Uh, if I, it, I, maybe 30 years ago, 40 years ago, if I had been in this room, everybody in this room would be smoking. Would have been smoking. And... I, if I had said <coughs> that smoke bothers me, I would have been ostracized. You're crazy. I, yeah. Right. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. So the so which you change the norm. Yeah. Exactly. And, and so that's the point. That the idea here is, if we legislate, mm -hmm. as we said, we ain't going to advertise to children, and we're going to do whatever else. Um, the change in our public health habit in the public health good as a result of Big Brother coming in around cigarettes has been enormous. And so, Bill, she's going to take your briskets and gravy away, brother. I got to tell you, it looks like Mama's ready to cut you off. <laughs> I love that. She got low-fat gravy, Bill. She's going to work at, at some turkey sausage. She, could, she can get you. And now I'm, I'm <laughs> he said, y'all took my lard. What's left? This is exactly right. I, I, I think about seatbelts as well. Yeah. Uh, so I'm 57 years old. Mother would drive down the road, all three children, jumping in the back seat. Uh, you know, never gave it a thought, did we? Never gave it a thought. Now you would call DSS on your smartphone. You got to throw this person in, in prison because she, she got her children jumping in the back seat. He said jumping in the back seat. They're also in the front seat. There you go. Every oh, jump, yeah. right. <laughs> the little one jumping in the front seat. Mama, can we stop at the A&W, uh -huh. right? And now we think, oh, my goodness. So, so there's a way in which... You know, again, this, this, this business of setting public health policy. There's a real interesting article last year, Dr. Tom Frieden at CDC, well, I guess a couple years ago now. But he talked about a pyramid of intervention. 
And, and his whole idea is we've got to intervene at the law policy level. So that if you just Google Tom Frieden's pyramid of intervention, he wants us to get out of the one-on-one, -on -one, uh, doing health education one-on-one, -on -one, and wants us to, to really focus on how can we change law and policy so that the norm like smoking, so that the default changes. How do we uh, uh, put calorie counts out there, limit access in schools? You know, there's another one limit what's available in schools. And yet, these individual schools, these individual families, these individual business owners, poor Bill, saying, Lord, can somebody just leave my breakfast alone? Right? Is the, the tension in the room. And, and, and again, just the idea that finding the best solution, there's no perfect solution, finding the best solution in any town. Um, so I am OUT of time. I'll just show you uh, uh, my thanks, uh, as I said, the, uh, the, the, uh, this work was really influenced. The CDC uh, ADS uh, uh, puts out some great stuff on ethics. Uh, Rhonda with the Wise Woman Program has offered support. Uh, uh, Renee and the people at the Office of Social Work have been exceptional. As always, the communications team here, the staff, uh, does an excellent job at helping people get ready. I hope there's been something valuable. Thank you to those of you who made time to come here. It's so much easier when there's with people to visit with. Uh, those of you watching on the video, I hope there's something helpful. Uh, I hope that there's something useful and please feel free to share this. And I always thank my mom and dad, not just because they uh, bought me a ticket because they're 89, bought me a degree. They're 89 years old and I love them and uh, uh, I'm lucky to have them. So uh, more information or to contact me, that that's my website. Uh, you phone and email are there if you've got follow-up questions. I know there's been a lot of information uh, with that, I'm supposed to turn it back to Renee, who's going to do the last procedural announcements. And uh, again, thanks to everybody. Renee, thanks to you for asking me. Thank you, Jim. I appreciate it. And we want to thank all of you for joining us today. And I hope you'll join us for the second segment of the ethics training as we talk about social media. So we'll see you then.